Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. Today's part 22 of the AI series where we're going to look at implementing an enemy skill again, this time the Fire Breath, which will be a channeled ability that the enemy will use whenever the player gets within range, and they'll stand there, use the ability for some amount of time, and then resume chasing the player like they were doing before. If you haven't checked out the previous video where we implemented the foundation, please go back and watch that one first. We're building on what we did there, and if you just jump into this one and have not checked out the last one, you're gonna have no idea what's going on with setting up the skill scripts of all objects and the kind of the coding paradigm we're gonna use today to implement this. So please check that one out if you haven't already. It's gonna be a card up here that I'm pretty sure it's right here. It links you back to the last video, so please check that one out if you've not already done that. In this video, we're going to do three main things. Create the skill scriptable object for Fire Breath. We will create a prefab that will do this effect and burn the player whenever they come by. And the third part will be we'll actually create that new mono behavior that applies damage to the player whenever they're within range of the skill. And before we go any further, I just want to give a huge shout out to everyone who's supporting me on Patreon right now. I really appreciate it. Every bit helps the channel grow, reach more people, add value to more people, and that means that more people are making their game development dream become a reality. If you want to help me in that cause, you can show your support on Patreon, patreon.com slash academy. You can get your name up on the screen, you can get a voice shout out, and some other cool perks. In this video, since we wanted to use some cool effects for things like Fire Breath, Unity actually provides us a really cool Unity Particle Pack on the Asset Store. If we search just Unity Particles and find this Unity Particle Pack, I'll import everything under the Effect Examples and nothing else. It will warn you that it'll override your project settings, but you can just uncheck the Project Settings folder and that will not override your settings. Once it's imported, we can find it in the Effect Examples in our Assets and I'll go to Fire and Explosion Effects, Prefabs, and drag the Flamethrower into the scene. And if we align that in front of my Unity Chan model, we can see this pretty cool flamethrower effect. And there's even some smoke that's disabled in there, so if I enable that one, and then maybe shorten the lifetime, shorten the size of the flames so it's not as ridiculously large, and restart the particle system, we'll see the smoke effects coming out the tip, and it's a more reasonable size. It's still pretty large, but I think it's going to be okay. We can just do damage based on the particles. So what I'm going to do is create a new empty game object called Area Damage and attach a capsule collider. You could make this be a cone to make it maybe more realistic because it kind of widens out towards the tip, but I think a capsule collider will work okay. I'll set it to be is trigger is true. And I'll change the layer to enemy attack radius and align it so it's in line with this flamethrower particle system. Then I'll go create a new C-sharp script called Area Damage that will apply to this capsule collider in a minute, and I'll create a new C-sharp script called Fire Breath Skill. We'll start with the Area Damage script. In here we'll add a public int damage, a public float tick rate, and a private I damageable damageable. This component will get set up by the Fire Breath Skill whenever it's enabled, and we'll set up the damage and the tick rate based on that Fire Breath scriptable object. The I damageable, if you haven't watched all the previous parts of the AI series, the I damageable is simply a reference to something that can take damage, and the player health implements this so it knows how to take damage. We'll implement private void on trigger enter collider other, that's the magic unity function, that gets called whenever a collider enters here that has a rigid body on it. We'll check if the damageable is null. If it is, then we'll try to get the I damageable component from the collider that entered. We'll check if that's not null. If it's not, then we'll assign this dot damageable to be that damageable, and we'll start a coroutine that will deal damage. Then we'll define that deal damage coroutine with private I enumerator deal damage. And in there we'll define a wait per seconds wait, a new wait per seconds based on the tick rate. And we'll say while the damage bull is not equal to null, we'll say damage bull dot take damage with whatever our damage is, and then you'll return the wait. What this means is the tick rate will be how many times per second we want this fire breath to deal damage. And we will continually deal damage until the fire breath ends or until the player exits. So quickly we'll do a private void on disable damage bull equals null. So whenever we disable this game object, we will unassign the damageable and we'll define the other magic unity function on trigger exit and I'll actually copy paste everything that we just did in the previous on trigger enter because we want to follow the same logic 
We'll check if the damageable is null. If the other component has a damageable component on it and that is not null, we will assign the damageable of the class to be null. Since we only have one player, we don't need to worry about if this is the same one that entered previously, and we don't need to worry about having multiple damageables that can take damage. So for our case here, it's very simple. We'll hop over to the fire breath skill. We'll make that also extend a skill scriptable object just like we did with the jump skill. And I'll define some variables here that will control how this fire breath skill works. You'll remember that we had duration and tick rate on the area damage, so I'll redefine those two here. I'll also put a public float range and set that to be three by default. That'll be how far away from the player we should be at most before we start using this skill. So we need to be close enough to trigger this, right? And just like we did with the jump skill, we'll define public override skill scriptable object scale up for level scaling scriptable object scaling and level. And in there we will still create a scaled skill. So we'll say fire breath scaled scaled skill equals create instance fire breath skill. We'll scale up our base values passing in the scaled skill scaling and level. And we'll assign the scaled skill duration tick rate and prefab to be whatever we have defined on the scriptable object and return back the scaled skill. And in can use skill, I actually noticed a little bit after doing the jump skill that a lot of stuff that I did in the jump skill can be brought up to the top level of the skill scriptable object can use skill. So when you define the public override bool can use skill that accepts that enemy and the player and the level, I'm going to return just base dot can use skill passing in again the enemy player level. And if the vector three dot distance of the enemy transform position and the player transform position is less than or equal to the range. So in the last video, we also put in things like the cooldown and if it's activated or not, but the skill scriptable object already knows about those things. So what we'll do real fast is refactor the base can use skill to check if we're not activating and if we have the cooldown available. So we'll open up the skill scriptable object and make can use skill return not is activating and level is greater than or equal to unlock level and the use time plus the cooldown is less than time dot time. Meaning we can open up the jump skill and remove the first two parts of that return of not is activating and the use time plus cooldown is less than time dot time because those are handled in the base can use skill now. Then let's do the public override void use skill that accepts the enemy and the player. We'll call base dot use skill with the enemy and the player. And then just like we did with jump skill, we'll say enemy dot start coroutine breathe fire passing the enemy and the player there. Then we'll define the breathe fire coroutine with private i enumerator breathe fire that accepts an enemy and a player. The first thing we'll do is say enemy dot animator dot set bool enemy movement dot is walking to be false. But in the last video, we didn't update this one because we didn't use it. So we'll hop over to the enemy movement and we'll change the accessibility level of is walking to be public, just like jump and landed. The next thing that I would like to do is the exact same thing we did with the jump, which is disable the enemy agent and disable the enemy movement and set the enemy movement state to be using ability. And since I can see that already, this is a really common thing. The first two skills that I considered doing this for, I needed the same piece of code. I'm going to go ahead and refactor these three lines into a method that's defined on the skill scriptable object. So any skill that I want, I don't have to copy paste this code. I can just call a function to execute this. So on the jump skill, I'll cut this code and make up a new method name called disable enemy movement passing in the enemy. We'll just paste that code right here with the enemy agent enabled false, enemy movement enabled false, and enemy movement state be enemy state that using ability. And since I already see that I'm going to want to re-enable this at the end, I'll go ahead and define that protected void enable enemy movement that accepts an enemy. We'll jump back to the jump skill and do the inverse where we enable the enemy movement and the enemy agent. Thinking a little bit ahead here, actually, I probably don't want to set the state in the disable enemy movement because A, the enemy state is not necessarily tied to the movement. For example, the instant cast skills, I would not set them to be using ability because these immediately happen. They would keep their previous state and B, the state has nothing to do with disabling the enemy movement. So it just doesn't make sense for that to happen inside this function. So I'll remove the setting of the enemy state and I will set enemy.enable to be false whenever we disable the enemy movement, which means on the jump skill, we'll need to again assign enemy.movement.state to be enemy state that using ability and we'll do the exact same thing on the fire breath skill. Then I will quickly make the enemy look at the player. So much like we did in the jump, we'll do for float time equals zero, time less than one, time plus equals time dot delta time. And I'm just gonna put times five because I want this to be really fast. And I'll do enemy dot transform dot rotation equals quaternion dot slurp, passing in the enemy rotation. And the second argument would be the quaternion look rotation to again, pass in the player dot transform dot position minus enemy dot transform dot position. That gives us the direction vector that the quaternion look rotation wants. And then the third variable 
critical is the time and we'll yield return null. So basically in a fifth of a second, our enemy will be looking at the player. And then what we want to do after our enemy is looking at the player is to spawn the fire breath. To do that, we need to get an object pool because we want our prefab for the fire breath to be a poolable object because we could have many, many, many different enemies using fire breath potentially at similar times and we don't want to create and destroy these objects all the time. So we'll say that an object pool pool equals object pool dot create instance passing the prefab and I'll put five. This could also be something configurable at the scriptable object level if you'd like. But if you watch the object pool video that we did, you'll know that this object pool dot create instance gives me a new instance every time. So that means that every time that I cast this fire breath skill, I'll be creating a new object pool with five fire breaths as part of it. And that's not really what we want. So let's open up the object pool. We'll add a private dictionary of poolable object to object pool called object pools to equal to a new dictionary. And this actually has to be static. And we'll check if the object pool dictionary contains the prefab key. We're going to do something there. Otherwise, what we'll do is create a new object pool and then add that to the dictionary. So I'll actually cut what I have below what we always did before, where we create that new game object and a new object pool. And I'll paste that into the else block. We'll go up to the top and say object pool pool equals null. At the bottom of that, we will say object pools dot add passing in the prefab and the pool. If we do already have this prefab as an object pool, we'll say pool equals object pools keyed by prefab. And then at the end, we will return the object pool that was either already created or that we just now created. A couple of videos ago, we made it wherever when you try to get an object, it would auto expand the size of our object pool. We are fairly confident that we will always get an object pool and we are fairly confident we will always get an object from any object pool. So setting the size to five by default is okay for our demo, but in your game, you may need to play with that number or even to find it at the scriptable object level, to find what a reasonable default size for your object pool or skill should be. We'll hop back to the fire breath skill and we'll say poolable object instance equals pool dot get object. We'll check if that's not null. If it's not null, we'll do instance dot transform dot set parent enemy agent transform saying the world's position does not stay. I'll adjust the local position to be zero one zero. So it's one unit up from the floor and that'll get us where it's relatively close to the unity chan's mouth for the fire breath. Around this time, you'd also want to set the the enemy's animation to I don't know, lean forward and do like a breath skill kind of animation, but I don't have that for you. So they're just going to stand still and breathe out fire. You'll get the idea whenever it plays. Once we have the instance positioned correctly, we'll do area damage, area damage equals instance dot get component and children area damage. And here we'll set up the damage and the tick rate of that area damage. Then we'll do for float time equals zero time less in duration time plus equals time dot delta time. And then we'll make the enemy look at the player by doing enemy dot transform dot look at player transform position. So we'll do that yield returning null so they will always use this fire breath for the full duration if you wanted whenever the player moved out of range you could also check here if the distance between the player and the enemy is greater than the range and then break out of that loop and continue down where we'll say use time equals time dot time we'll then set the instance dot game object set active to be false so this fire breath prefab goes away We'll then re-enable the enemy movement. We already defined that at the skill scriptable object level and we'll set is activating to be false. And one important thing to remember is to include the enemy state resetting. So right after we disable the enemy movement, I'm going to do enemy.movement.state equals state.usingAbility. So that way we've marked that our enemy has changed states into they're using this ability. And right after I enable the enemy movement, I will reset the enemy to be in the chase state. If we hop back to the Unity editor, I'll rename this prefab to be Fire Breath Skill and I'll attach the poolable object component to the root. I'll also add the area damage to the area damage object and I'll drag this prefab as a prefab variant to the same folder that the Fire Breath came from. I'll then do create skills fire breath. I'll leave it named fire breath skill. We'll change the cooldown to 15. I'll set the damage to be three, the duration to be three, the tick rate 0.5 and the range to be three. I'll then drag the prefab that we just made to this prefab field. I'll select the basic enemy and set their skill to be the fire breath skill instead of jump. I'll then remove this prefab from the scene and click play. I'll run around waiting for the enemy to come find me. Remember that it's a 15 second cooldown so we need to wait at least 15 seconds. And once she gets in range, she starts using this fire breath on me for three seconds and then it disappears. We'll have it happen one more time. I'll set my health to be 300 so we can watch the damage tick down my life.
And there it goes again. Perfect. Now we have a channeled ability for our enemy where they stand still, channel their ability, and then continue chasing. I hope you got a lot of value out of today's video and you understand how to implement the fire breath skill scriptable object. And more generically, you understand how to implement a channeled ability with the skill scriptable objects that we've been setting up. If you have been getting value out of this video or the series, please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. There's more videos posted every Tuesday and sometimes on other days too. If you have any questions, if you have a suggestion for a topic, or if you're implementing AI into your game, drop a comment down below and I'll see you on the next video.